Hello, I'm Jeff Pierce, and it's Toronto, and it's November 2023, and I've got a message here for Westerners, for Western reporters, Western policymakers. It's simple. You can't examine a conflict with historical roots unless you're actually bothering to examine the proper history. And this ain't it. Even in discussing what's happening in the Amhara region today, you have Western reporters repeating nonsense that there was an Amhara-dominated Abyssinian empire. First of all, there never was an Abyssinia. Ethiopia never called itself that. The term is a European corruption of a name for a group of people in the north, Habashat. And all the way back in the 4th century, King Azana of Aksum corrected an official document in Greek using the term Habashat with Ethiopia. So who are the Amhara people? If we look to the ancient language of Gez, Am means people, while Hera means free. And if you do your homework, you learn that as scholar Tedesi Tamrat points out, by the 10th century, the population of southern Tigray also included Amhara, and at this stage of the history of the kingdom, the main difference between these people was perhaps only linguistic. This is what you need to understand. Ethiopia is a product of its different peoples, working collaboratively as much as they competed against each other. Ethiopia's first great empire was the Kingdom of Aksum, but this doesn't mean it was Tigrayan. It covered a far wider area than Tigray, and even the word for the town, Aksum, is partly rooted in the Agar language. A, in their tongue, meant water, while the Semitic word, Siom, meant chief. The dynasty that followed the Aksumites was the Zagwe of the Agar people, and there's archaeological evidence that the oldest parts of rock-hewn churches in Lasta date from the tail end of the Aksumite period in the 7th and 8th centuries. Lalibela, for instance, is a product of King Lalibela of the Zagwe dynasty. Now, I can't go through 3,000 years of Ethiopian history here, but the bottom line is that there was no Amhara domination. Never happened. Part of the misunderstanding of these issues involved is that idiots, and by idiots I mean certain reporters, like to arbitrarily go, oh, let's mention Ethiopian history from here, the mid-19th century. Tell me something. Do you think you can understand America by rolling back the date to 1889? Does that give you enough context to understand American affairs? So, why would you think that you can understand Africa if you just arbitrarily peg the date to the 19th century? The biggest influences on Ethiopian history since ancient times right up to the turn of the 20th century, were crown and church. In fact, the very root of this conflict doesn't start from the era of Emperor Menelik II, it goes back to the 16th century. The short version is this. In the 1500s, a fanatic nicknamed Grand, the left-handed, who was probably ethnic Somali, led a Muslim invasion out of the Adal Sultanate into Ethiopia with Muslims who didn't even really want to invade Ethiopia, but who shrugged and went, okay, fine, we'll go, Gran. And they nearly wiped it out, making Emperor Lebna Dengel into a refugee in his own land. His son Galadeus managed to beat back the invaders with a little Portuguese help, but this war left the southern territories vulnerable to a whole new invasion, what's often referred to as the Aromo Migration. But here's the twist, and this is important. The Aromos divided into different groups over the centuries, some followed Gada, a traditional system with semi-democratic values, while others had kings and queens. And you had two-way cultural assimilation and cooperation with Ethiopia of that time. You had a prince in his teens kidnapped by a group of Boran Oromo, but they liked the kid and taught him their ways. Then, Susanios used those skills to become emperor, and he understood the Oromo so well that he used a strategy of containment and control, allying himself with some groups while brutally putting down others. It was a brutal era, in which, by the way, Oromos made another people, the Gafet, extinct. By the 1750s, a boy named Eos was on the throne. His first language was Oromo, but his grandma, who was the empress, was very into power games, and she invited down Mikhail Sahul, 
who looks here like Ethiopia's version of Mr. Burns, a Tigrayan noble who soon took over as virtual dictator. The whole story involves one sniper assassination attempt, another by two incompetent Garagi assassins, his assassination of two different emperors, a civil war, and the whole thing makes Game of Thrones look like a church picnic. Finally, it took a coalition of different ethnicities, including about a thousand Tigrayans, to get rid of this guy. Even when you get to the famous Zemina Mesifant, the era of the princes, you had the central power run for some 80 years by the Yeju dynasty, or to be more accurate, led by a Romo who gravitated to the Orthodox Church and Amhara customs. And historians still argue over who ran the show, if anyone cared who was emperor around then, but one of the country's greatest historians, Baru Zuda, has made the point that Gondor was where the action was. So the regional lords intended to dominate the center, not to go away from it. All this time, Amharic was the lingua franca of the nation. It was a Tigrayan emperor, Johannes IV, who later made Amharic Ethiopia's national language. Even Asfa Wosan Asarate, the most senior member of the surviving royal family and who knew the man personally, says his great uncle Haile Selassie was of mixed heritage. So, where was this Amhara domination? Now, this isn't to say that there weren't ethnic tensions, but these were exacerbated by conditions in the modern era starting from around the 20th century, including from foreign influence. The fascist Italians who invaded Ethiopia in 1935 tried a divide-and-rule approach that didn't work out very well for them. When the liberation came in 1941, it was different groups of Ethiopian patriots, Arbanoch, working together with British help and colonial Africans and Indians to help free the country. Jaga Mikello, for instance, was ethnic Oromo and ended up a senior officer in Haile Selassie's army. He was a war hero. If we have to pinpoint where the real trouble started, it was in the 1960s. American and European professors with a Marxist take on things, playing white savior, came to teach in Ethiopia and made an impression on their students. This isn't just me saying this, it's documented. Also, what's widely overlooked is that you had ethnic separatist movements going on around the world. Basques in Spain, the FLQ terrorist group in Canada, the Biafran struggle in the Nigerian Civil War. Of course there were radical Ethiopians paying attention. Then along came a student activist named Wallalim Makonin, who gave a speech and wrote an article claiming Ethiopia is not really one nation, it is made up of a dozen nationalities. He didn't back this up with anything like facts or references, mind you, but Wolin is a hero to ethno-nationalists, and his toxic ideas even made it into the constitution written up by the TPLF decades later. But a couple of points to remember about this guy who concocted this idea about Amhara being dominant. He was an Amhara. And he himself admitted, Amharas are not dominant because of inherent imperialist tendencies. The Oromos could have done it, the Walamos, that is, Wololeta, could have done it, and history proves they tried to do so. Oh, and his final act on this planet was to get some guns and grenades with some friends and go hijack a plane full of innocent passengers. But security was on board, and so he was shot dead, leaving the world no poorer. So then we come to the Marxist Dirk, which murdered thousands of people, and the person who wrote this line is a gullible idiot, because Mengistu Haile Mariam, the leader of the Dirk, was, still is, a Romo. So were many Dirk officials. But to nitpick over which emperor or head of state was this ethnicity or that one is to play a sucker's game. What about the fact that Mendelik II relied on Gobina and a Romo general to help him gain submission of different Oromo groups? Both Johannes IV and Liji Yasu spent considerable amounts of time among the Afar. Rasayum Mangesha was to Grain and one of Haile Selassie's advisors in the post-war period. Yet toxic ideology took root, so that by 1976 the TPLF could write in its manifesto that Amhara are its traditional enemy, even though scholars point out its inherent flaws.
We now know that even as the TPLF was part of a coalition of forces against the Derg, it was torturing and incarcerating Amhara people in complexes of caves and natural formations in Wakayat. And there are survivors still around to tell the tale. When ordinary Amhara, farmers, teachers, all kinds of professions, took to the hills and joined Fano units, they fought to help save Ethiopia after the TPLF launched its daily war in late 2020. But as they fought like patriots, Abi Ahmed's government starved them of ammunition and help, and Amhara were still attacked, massacred, and displaced by the TPLF's ally, OLF Sheni, in parts of Oromia. Congratulations, American officials. This is who you backed for close to 30 years, and this is who you are still protecting now. And the Amhara wait for justice. No one should have to live in fear like this. The Amhara were locked out of Pretoria and told to disarm, even though TPLF refused to do so and kept its weapons. They're told to give up their guns as more churches are attacked, mosques are demolished, more incidents of ethnic cleansing happen. Now, in addition to lies about their history, Amhara face lies in news coverage about Fana, portraying them as ethno-fascists. But they're not. They're citizen soldiers trying to save their own people. Fano draws on the tradition of the Ethiopian Arbanoch, the heroes who fought against Italian fascism. Indeed, they have a code of conduct that dictates they don't mistreat or steal from the people, they don't abuse their captive government soldiers. Abby's government wants you to see a terrorist group, but it's a mass movement from the people on the ground. When you hear Fano, think French resistance. Think the Republicans fighting Franco in Spain. Think partisans in the Second World War. Eskinder Nega, the celebrated activist in Ethiopia's Nelson Mandela, has joined a Fano unit and says Fano's paramount quest and vision is the prevention of genocide. To this noble end, we recognize that the emphasis of identity politics is an essential goal. That is the goal we shall strive for. You know, one day a whole generation of Amhara children will be adults, but they'll still have been traumatized by war, displacement, betrayal at the hands of those who supposedly govern. This is why Fano fights the way it does, because there must be examples for this generation growing up of restraint, civics, compassion, even towards the enemy, patriots. You who make policy in the West, you who does the consulting or has decided that the West has to influence Africa, here's your chance to do something, not for the sake of a security agenda, which is code for, gee, we can do business there, but to actually help people. They want to go on living. They want a hand in their own political affairs. And they want to preserve 3,000 years of history. Will you help them? They're going to fight on whether you do it or not. They will win as they have always won. But you can help save lives if you stand with them. Fano are the partisans. Fano are the heroes. And right now, Fano means freedom. Fano, Fano, Yundrinat, Tata Kiva Gemede, Yundrinat, Tata Kiva Gemede, Vishina Morangi, 